As one would suspect, he has interviewed some of history's most notable figures, and he is the recipient of numerous awards. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences honored him with an Emmy Award for his 1996 coverage of the Oklahoma City bombing. In that same year, he also received a Golden Cable Ace from the National Academy of Cable Programming for his and CNN's coverage of the Persian Gulf War. He also was the recipient of the 2004 Journalist Pillar of Justice Award from the Respect for Law Alliance and the 2003 Daniel Pearl Award from the Chicago Press Veterans Association. Mr. Blitzer is the author of two books, between Washington and Jerusalem, a reporter's notebook, and Territory of Lies. And we are honored to have him here with us today, Wolf Blitzer. Thank you, thank you so very much for that really nice introduction. And thanks so much for inviting me to the class of 2011. Congratulations. This is a very special moment for you and your families, and I want to wish all of you only the best. The graduates, uh, all of you, have worked really hard to reach this milestone. This is truly an impressive achievement, and all of you should be very proud. My own daughter graduated from college not all that long ago, so as a parent, I can certainly relate to what all you moms and dads are feeling right now. I want to thank uh, the Penn State College of Communications for inviting me here today and bestowing this great honor on me. I'd also like to thank the wonderful faculty members of this university. They all do, and I think all of the students can testify, they all do amazing work, and they are our heroes. Let's give the faculty a big round of applause. <laughs> Penn State is an outstanding university. You have a worldwide network of wonderful graduates, you are part of an excellent tradition, and keep up that tradition. I know all of you will. Most of you, the graduates, unless you're really, really old, and I don't think many of you are, grew up during this decade that followed 9-11. As you grew up, you saw our world change, as the fear of terror grew as well. Earlier generations, I can testify, did not have to take their shoes off to board an airplane. They didn't have to worry about how much shampoo or mouthwash they could take on a plane. But the world changed nearly 10 years ago very dramatically for all of us. And in recent days, U.S. Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. I think it's fair to say all of us will always remember precisely where we were when we heard the news. I was in my kitchen. I was watching the Washington Capitals lose in a hockey game, the playoff game, unfortunately. Alex Ovechkin had just scored a tying goal with a minute to go in the third period, but we lost in overtime. But I got a call from one of my producers saying, you got to get to the studio right away. The White House has just notified us that the President will be in the East Room of the White House at 10.30 to deliver a major statement. Uh, and it would be about 10 minutes in length. They wouldn't tell us what it's about. My initial suspicion was, well, maybe something about Libya or Gaddafi, uh, but then I started making phone calls, and I was told it had nothing to do with Libya, nothing to do with Gaddafi, but it was very, very important, and it involved our national security, at which point I began to suspect what it was about. I knew he wouldn't be going into the East Room of the White House, which is the majestic room, and walk through that corridor to get into the East Room unless he had a, a, a really historic and major announcement to make. Within minutes of getting that word, I was on the studio set. I was anchoring CNN's worldwide coverage. And it's been a, a rather emotional ride for all of us ever since. Let's not be under any illusions, however. The threat of terror even after bin Laden, remains very, very strong. So even if bin Laden himself is gone, I think it's fair to say we'll still have to take off our shoes before we board airplanes and check how much shampoo and mouthwash we have. 
Let me uh, say something about CNN, which is now in its 31st year. All of you have only known a world in which there's been 24-7 news, cable news channels. Ted Turner, however, the founder of CNN, he had a wonderful idea. This 24-7 television news uh, concept, broadcasting news not only to Americans, to people in the United States, but around the world. Back in 1980, people thought he was crazy. We already had three broadcast networks. They did a daily 30-minute newscast. Uh, they didn't uh, want to expand those newscasts to an hour, still haven't expanded those newscasts to an hour. So what was Ted Turner possibly thinking? How could a 24-7 news organization really work on television? But he did have a brilliant idea, and he literally changed the world. Now there are plenty of 24-7 cable and satellite channels in the United States, local, national. There are many, many more around the world, and they're reporting in dozens of languages, informing viewers about what's going on. In the process, they often make life miserable for some of the really bad guys out there, and we can testify to that when we see what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa right now. Yes, the social networks certainly have changed the world for people in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Bahrain, Syria, and so many other countries. But let's not forget the cable channels, the satellite television channels, radio, they had a tremendous impact as well. Ted Turner and CNN started something amazing, and we don't yet know where all of this will stop. No one appreciates freedom of the press more than journalists, especially when we either lose it or think we're losing it. I recently was at a dinner with a United States Supreme Court justice and he startled me by thanking me for protecting the First Amendment to the Constitution. Wow, I, I thought to myself, so nice. I was being honored by a, chief, by a justice of the Supreme Court. It, it's true, though. All of us who are journalists, we protect the First Amendment automatically, even if we don't always recognize what we're doing. It's in our very nature. It's in our job. And those of you, and I hope many of you, will want to become journalists, you will begin to feel that very, very quickly. You don't always appreciate what a wonderful concept freedom of the press is until you don't have it any longer. I spent six days in North Korea in December covering Governor Bill Richardson's talks there with the North Korean leadership. It was a very delicate moment on the Korean Peninsula. Tensions were high. A million North Korean soldiers faced off against nearly a million South Korean soldiers along the demilitarized zone, 30,000 American troops in between. Fortunately, there was no war. While in North Korea, though, I didn't have any First Amendment rights, and I knew it. I had North Korean officials with me all the time telling us where we could go, where we could not go, who we could speak to, who we could not speak to. These officials were all very nice. They spoke English well but it's not exactly the way we American journalists like to operate. I also didn't have a cell phone. They confiscated that. No internet service. No BlackBerry, can you imagine, for six days. By the way, uh, when I flew back from Pyongyang to Beijing and picked up my BlackBerry, I had more than 1,000 emails awaiting me. For those of you planning a trip, by the way, a uh, little vacation, Air Corio, which is the official airline of North Korea, it's a pretty good airline, I must say. Uh, nice, clean, Russian-made Tupolev jets. One good news, and I'll share this with you, I did have CNN International in my hotel room. They allowed it. It was the only way I could find out what was happening in the outside world, though I did get nervous when I woke up very early one morning, turned on the TV, and saw only mush on the screen, on all the channels. I assumed that was the North Korean way of telling me that hostilities were about to begin between the North and the South, and they were cutting off information from the outside world. I only realized when I went down to the hotel lobby that it was snowing badly outside, and the huge satellite dishes were all covered with snow, hence no picture or sound. What a relief that was. I should also give myself and my show a plug. When I met with North Korea's chief nuclear negotiator in Pyongyang, he immediately said to me with a very straight face, he said, Mr. Wolf, I know you are equally as powerful as President Obama. 
And I said, what? He said, well, only the two of you have your own situation rooms. I laughed, uh, but since then I've been thinking about that a little bit. I knew uh, uh, he was joking, at least I think he was joking. Uh, I was flattered, but I will say this, my situation room is very powerful. Uh, And it's not just my situation room, it's all of our situation rooms, those of us who are journalists, whether we're in television, radio, digital news, print, whatever. We send out powerful words and images that have a profound impact around the world. And just look what's happening right now. Uh, But it's not just happening right now. It's happened for a long time. 20 years ago, almost exactly, 1991, CNN sent me to Moscow to cover the aftermath of the failed Soviet coup. The KGB plotters had failed to overthrow Gorbachev and his glasnost perestroika reform agenda. When I met with the New Soviet defense minister in Moscow after the failed coup, Air Marshal Yevgeny Shapushnikov, he thanked me for CNN's coverage of the coup. I was startled because this was still at a time of the Cold War. He said the whole world was watching what was happening on the streets of Moscow thanks to CNN. As head of the Soviet Air Force at the time, he had refused KGB orders to bomb pro-Gorbachev, pro-Yeltsin demonstrators, he said to me, if the coup had succeeded, I would have been sent to Siberia or worse. Thank you, CNN. He then granted me permission to visit previously restricted Soviet military bases, telling his aides, let him go, no more secrets, this is CNN, it's a whole new world. There was no Google in those days, there was no Facebook, no Twitter, no social network sites, no internet no cell phones, no email. There were fax machines, copying machines. There was the BBC, the Voice of America. There was CNN. Four months later, there was no more Soviet Union. 74 years of communist rule had collapsed. The Cold War was over. And now we're seeing a whole new wave of remarkable change unfolding in another part of the world. What is key, though, as important as the social network sites are, as important as television or radio or print or fax machines were, as important as all of that is, people are willing to stand up and fight for their freedom and fight for their liberty. People have been doing that for a long time, and when they have the ability, the strength, the courage to do that, change happens. As we sit here at Penn State University, let's not forget the journalists the reporters, the photographers, the producers, halfway around the world, who are also putting their lives on the line so the world knows about the revolutions sweeping North Africa and the Middle East, the terrible violence and the repercussions. Journalists, including some of my colleagues, have suffered and continue to suffer gravely. Some have been the victims of violent assaults and beatings. Others have been detained by desperate regimes and tortured. It's paramount to believe in our brothers and sisters in the line of fire, to keep them in our collective conscious as we go about our daily reporting. A few weeks ago when I went to Cairo and walked around Tahrir Square and saw what was going on, and this was after after, uh, Hosni Mubarak had been removed as president, it was still tense and I still admired what my fellow journalists were able to do. I'm an optimist by nature. I think in part because of the optimism that my mother and father always had, despite some very difficult experiences in their own lives. They came to Buffalo as immigrants who struggled to make a living and raise two kids. But they did just fine, thanks to a lot of hard work, strong values, a ton of love, a welcoming, warm community, and some good luck as well. Yes, they certainly had some lucky breaks, but even more important, and I want you to remember this as you go forward, they took full advantage of each and every one of those breaks. Here's some advice. If you get a lucky break, don't coast with it, don't waste it, don't misuse it, grab it and make the most of it. I know many of you are wondering whether there are jobs out there, whether there are genuine opportunities, whether your careers can really take off. You're not alone in wondering that. The answer is yes. I'm sure you can do it 
I have no doubt you would not have reached this stage, graduating from this great university, if you didn't have what it takes. It wasn't all that long ago I had your fears. When I graduated from college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure if I would ever get a real job. I was deeply worried. But I worked really hard, took advantage of every break, exploited those opportunities, and soon things began to fall into place. Over these decades, I've never really slowed down. When I was a young, budding journalist, one old timer told me, I was working for the Reuters news agency, a British news organization. He said, you're only as good as your last story. Don't forget that. Bottom line, no matter what field you pursue, keep doing your very best every single day. The competition, I can testify, is intense. And it's not just competition from Americans. The world is a much smaller place these days. We now have to compete with world-class brains from around the world. It is truly becoming a global village. So in this current economic environment, when there are so many people out there looking for jobs, you have no luxury of slacking or going on cruise control. Here's another piece of advice. You are way too young right now to settle. Don't give up on your dream. If you can, if you can combine your livelihood with your passion, you will enjoy work and life so much more. I know I get up every morning and look forward to going to work. I love my job. I'm truly blessed with my career at CNN. I have a front row seat to history. I get paid to ask newsmakers tough questions. Can you imagine? For a journalist, it doesn't get any better than that. Earlier this month, by the way, I celebrated my 21st anniversary at CNN. It's been an amazing ride every single day covering all the big stories of our time, whether the first Gulf War, or the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of apartheid in South Africa, 9-11, the wars that followed, the election of the first African-American president in U.S. history, bin Laden's death in recent days. I know this. I will be a little bit smarter when I go to sleep than, when I, was, than, uh, than I was when I woke up in the morning. That's because I learn every single day. If you can feel that same excitement in your career, you will be so much better at whatever you do. In short, and I'll summarize with this, if you can find that job you really love, grab it. In the end, you may discover that you have to settle for a second, maybe even a third best, in order to make a living, and that's very important. But right now, if possible, keep your dream alive. Having sat in your seats, I know that your immediate dream is for me to wrap this up so we can all begin the celebration, and I want to party on. You should party. You should be happy. You should enjoy this day. You deserve it. Thanks again to Penn State, the College of Communications, for inviting me. Thanks again and congratulations to the class of 2011. And I'll leave you with these very important words with emphasis. We are. Thank you.